All right, the squad. We've had a couple of votes recently on the channel for what the next video should be. And today's video is actually one that finished second. Don't worry, top votes are always gonna happen. This is just the one I was most up for making today. Sometimes things just happen that are out of your control. This should be a good one because it's a video about a very, very bad time in TNA history. They just kicked off the Spike TV network. All their stars had left the company. Constant reports that they were going to go bust, and in steps a musician to try and steer the ship through all of these icebergs. This should be interesting. It's bold boy Billy Corgan. Did he keep TNA alive like an organ? Corgan joined TNA Impact Wrestling as a senior producer of creative and talent development in April 2015. Upon joining, he said, There's a tremendous opportunity to go into a really fresh new direction. Having characters who explore race or transgender issues is certainly a possibility. Corgan believes his ideas are going to break new ground. Those social and cultural issues that are sort of don't go their subject at the moment will result in themes that will be more meaningful to current audiences. So will any of that happen? TNA are on the TV channel Destination America. The company was about a year into a major slide at this point. It was a weird time where TNA had just got kicked off Spike TV, allegedly because Russo was secretly working for them. They lost all their momentum, and by the end of 2014 the show was nothing but a recap show. But they did eventually get the Destination America deal. They moved TNA to Friday nights to take advantage of SmackDown moving to Thursday nights. This is a new day. A new beginning. A fresh start. But that doesn't mean we forget where we've been or who we are. A year, a new network, but the same attitude. Seek and destroy. Destination America said they were happy but apparently not happy enough with the ratings. They expected better to justify the costs of the show. News was leaked in May 2015 that they won't be renewing TNA on their network. They found the name TNA to be tainted and sponsorship was an issue. They moved the show to Wednesday night in the middle of 2015, but they had a contract and TNA would stay on their channel for the time being. So it's really weird, they know they're gonna get kicked off the channel, but they're staying on the channel for the next few months at least. Enter Billy Corgan, with TNA not even sure what network it would be on the following year. Despite the network troubles, the roster wasn't completely terrible. They still had Perk Angle as the world champion, but his opponents were not as compelling as they once were. Lashley, The Hardy, Samoa Joe, Bobby Roode, James Storm, they were all still here. The show just about still felt like TNA. But it's not talked about often, but Angle almost went down with the ship. He was one of the final major stars to leave the company. I love this man. The first storyline which came out of nowhere and potentially had Billy Corgan's involvement was women's champion Terran Terrell and the Dollhouse. She seemed fairly normal up to this point, but now she had her own faction who were grown women but thought they were babies or something. I don't know, I've never understood this Dollhouse faction. It's just weird to me, are these supposed to be crazy people? She feuds with Gail and tries to steal her husband, Chef Robert Irvine, for some reason. The knockouts are heavily focused on sex appeal around this time, with Terrence Rail and Brooke Adams getting lots of TV time. It certainly feels like TNA. Meanwhile, another crazy person was Cowboy James Storm, who had been changed from a happy beer-drinking cowboy to a psychopath who brainwashed people, beat them up in barns, and formed a faction of random characters called The Revolution. But despite that, Storm is desperately trying to convince Mickey James to join The Revolution for some reason. It was completely out of the blue and made no sense. It was never explained why he suddenly acted normal and was trying to persuade Mickey to join him. This of course upsets her boyfriend Magnus, Nick Aldis, who's trying to protect her, but Storm just won't leave her alone. So that's a feud. Bully Ray returned to the company to play a boring referee for some reason, and then later a general manager for like a month. He was apparently a man Dixie could trust. A man who had tried to destroy our company with the aces and eights and also powerbombed her through a table. Yeah, that guy. Velvet Sky returned with a new character and attacked her former partner Angelina Love. Her new gothic character led nowhere except the 50th Beautiful People reunion. In the main event, Kurt Angle and Eric Young had been feuding for five weeks. Eric Young had been hanging around with the struggling beatdown faction. He's not a member, but he is a friend. The faction is dead weight because members of the faction keep leaving TNA and Hernandez caused the faction to get pulled from telly because when they signed him and put him on telly, it turned out he still had a contract with Lucha Underground. They had to destroy weeks of footage from the show, completely ruining the entire show. The Hardys were the tag team champions, but Jeff Hardy crashed his bike, broke his leg, and the tag titles were relinquished. To say TNA was a mess when Corgan joined the company is an understatement. It was amateur hour, everything was going wrong. 
Also getting a push at this time was one-legged wrestler Chris Melendez, a personality black hole and also a war hero. Awkward. From here on, it would become mandatory in Impact to have a wrestler pull off his prosthetic leg at least once per episode. Also, Drew McDonald and his rising faction. EC3 is on a slow burn to the top of the company. He's been beating legends left, right and centre, and he's cutting promos that he's not getting a shot at the world title. It makes perfect sense, and his build is one of the best things they did around this time. Unfortunately, his backup is Fat Boy Tyrus, a man that Billy Corgan would go up to strike a big friendship with. The lack of money in the company was starting to become an issue as more and more indie talent started to appear. This rubbed long-time fans the wrong way who were used to more mainstream stars who were entertainers and not work-rate wrestlers. For about two months straight, the Wolves and Ares and Rude had tag matches for the belts. The matches were great, but the Wolves weren't able to spar with Ares and Rude on the mic. Plus, it was getting repetitive to have the same match for 20 minutes each show. Now, remember that cowboy James Storm who was just randomly trying to be friends with Vicky James? Well, she completely fell for it like a dumbass. He took her to Nashville for a record deal or something, which resulted in James Storm pushing Mickey into the train tracks whilst fake train noises play in the background. This incident upset a lot of people. I was mainly just insulted by how stupid and pointless the whole thing was. Storm had been courting her for months just to try and murder her. Well, it didn't stop there because James Storm kidnapped the baby of Mickey James and Magnus, whilst the security held Magnus back from protecting his own kid. And then Storm kicked the pram off the ramp. Kick the baby! Only to reveal that it was a dummy. No, I guess we're the dummies. Another new character that joined TNA around this time was Grado, a wrestler who had a lot of popularity in the UK indies, but I'm not sure his gimmick really translated that well to American TV. I think they viewed him as the new Dusty Rhodes or something. Former Goldberg knockoff Crimson also briefly returned to TV, although I'm not sure why, because they didn't have any storylines for him. He just lost some matches and was gone a couple of months later. Mike today was winding down his TNA career at this point and only appeared sporadically. He was replaced on commentary by Josh Matthews. Then, a wild slap nut appeared with Bitch Wife. Double J, Jeff Jarrett. Jeff was in the middle of trying to get his new wrestling promotion, Global Fast Wrestling, off the ground. He'd been gone from TNA screen since Rinka King. TNA wanted him back to compete in a King of the Mountain match. His match. Jarrett had been trying to buy TNA along with Toby Keith, but the Carters had demanded that Dixie stay in TNA as an authority figure. Jarrett didn't like that call, so he started Global Fast Wrestling instead. More importantly, in July, the undefeated EC3 captured his first TNA heavyweight title after beating Perk Angle. Angle was getting old and TNA wanted a new star to run with. Dixie Carter was also back on TV after a year. It must have been really confusing being a TNA wrestler at this time. Who's your boss? Jarrett? Dixie? Billy Corgan? Or is it the TV network? But that's not enough bosses because we've also got Bully Ray. Okay, he's not a real boss. Dixie inducted Slapnuts into the Hall of Fame, but he wasn't going anywhere anytime soon. Someone who was going somewhere though was Austin Aries. TNA had pushed him quite hard for a few years, it was quite a success story, but he actually left the company in August 2015. Despite his good matches for the company, nobody seemed quite as bothered as the other names which had left like Samoa Joe. Aries would be back one day anyway. Eli Drake got to finally break out as a single star and he cut the odd good promo around this time. It wasn't for a year that he'd become more of a main eventer though. Jeff Hardy returned to the company at the end of July and made it clear that he's back to support his brother Matt Hardy in capturing the heavyweight title. Matt Hardy had constant title shots but was too much of a loser. As mentioned earlier, Bully Ray was manager, but he was quickly traded out for Slapnuts as a manager. He then went on to put GCW wrestlers on the show. It was more guys who didn't represent the TNA style. The James Storm Revolution, which is one of the worst factions of all time, is somehow carrying on. James Storm having drama with a bunch of the most random jobbers of all time, bullying them and torturing them just because he's a dick. It was not a good storyline. Another feud that had gone on for months at this point was Eric Young and Chris Melendez feuding over a leg. Eric Young was obsessed with taking this leg because he was mentally unstable. It sucked. Melendez eventually won his own leg back in a match to end the story. A real feel-good punch to the gut. Taryn Terrell decided to leave TNA because she found God. This was right in the middle of the Dollhouse faction storyline which had been major on the show for a few months. Rebel took her place, and they were eventually led by Awesome Kong, and still to this day I have no idea what the deal with this gimmick was. The new major storyline was that Jarrett's global fast wrestling faction was feuding with the TNA roster, of which Jarrett was in charge of both, so I'm not sure why they were allowed to feud. 
The Wolves lost the tag belts to Trevor Lee and Brian Myers. Possibly the most random, forgettable title change of all time. The Wolves took the titles back the next week too. Anyway, meanwhile Jeff Jarrett reveals that he was actually a heel this whole time, and there's now a hostile takeover going on. For the 100th time in TNA history they did a takeover storyline. A match was set, winner takes all, and all the TNA shares are on the line. The only other woman other than Karen Jarrett in the group was Lady Tapper, a woman who had previously been in TNA, and she failed. But now she's back, failing again. They seem to want to have a monster versus monster match of Awesome Kong, even though neither of them are the champion. Tess Marker's ass was still the champion. Dixie Carter's TNA eventually banished Jeff Jarrett's GFW from Impact. Jeff got to have his final moment in the sun, and he got to advertise his rubbish wrestling company on TV. Meanwhile, as part of the deal, Jarrett had to give his final TNA shares back to Dixie Carter. By September 2015, the show was down 72% of viewers from the original 1.06 million viewers that the show averaged in September 2014 when they were still on Spike TV. It was clear that Billy Corgan's creative had not been able to stop the slide, but at the same time it probably wasn't his fault. By September, it was public knowledge that nobody wanted TNA on their network anymore and all the stars had left. Nobody wanted to tune into a company which was dying and might not be around in a couple of months, why bother getting invested? Bound for Glory 2015 was the final pay-per-view of the year and it was only October. EC3 had to defend his title against Galloway and Matt Hardy. Randomly, Matt Hardy won the match to capture the world title, a huge moment in his career. But then on the following impact, it was revealed that somehow EC3 had done an injunction against TNA, and this somehow meant that Matt Hardy was no longer the champion. He was also banned from Impact forever, apparently. So what's going on here then? Well, basically, due to Destination America not reviewing them on the network, there was no more TNA shows and no TV network to have them on. So for the next two months, all we got on the TNA show was a pre-recorded Bound for Glory series tournament taped several months earlier, so it was a complete waste of time with no storylines, just match after match after match. Just skip it all. Ultimately, 2015 will go down as one of the worst years in company history of a complete lack of buzz, constant negativity, a weak main event scene, wrestlers who didn't belong on the main stage, Jeff Jarrett's horrible GFW invasion, and then two months where they aired nothing but pre-taped matches from months before. I'm sure a lot of the final hangers on quit TNA watching for good for all of that. TNA eventually signed a TV deal with Pop TV, a smaller TV network which nobody had ever heard of. But at least they found a network because there were doubts they could find any network. The year started off with Kurt Angle announcing that he was retiring, but he wanted to do a farewell tour first. He would be gone by the end of the month for his final televised match against Bobby Lashley. James Storm and Bobby Roode reformed Beer Money. It was pointless. Also, Mike Bennett and Maria debuted in TNA. They were going to be a big part of TNA programming going forward. In a change nobody could ever predicted, Matt Hardy and EC3 were the tournament winners, so now they will fight again for the belt on the first Pop TV episode. EC3 won, and once again he was the World Heavyweight Champion. But once again, it was pointless because just a couple of weeks later Matt Hardy turned heel when he recruited Tyrus and beat EC3 in a last man standing match. Hardy was the champion again. This was the birth of big money Matt Hardy. A greasier, puffier, more disease badger with typhoid kind of Hardy. If you weren't a fan of Matt Hardy, this was a difficult time period in TNA to sit through as he cuts promos like Triple H twice a show. At this point, the Wolves are a big part of the show. They're in the ring doing their normal bad promo when suddenly Marilyn Manson starts blaring out over the sound system. Rosemary debuts for TNA and she has Crazy Steve in Abyss and this is the first thing that really had Billy Corgan's fingerprints all over it. A gothic faction with some music that they could never use without Billy Corgan's link in the music industry. This was one of the most memorable things from Corgan's reign. It doesn't mean it didn't have holes in it. For instance, Jimmy Havoc threatened Rosemary and said they had unfinished business, but it was never resolved what their business was. I expect it was just TNA being cheap when they were in the UK, so they had him work a couple matches. Bobby Lashley was randomly given a Brazilian love interest, which is something we can all aspire to have one day. But the storyline was dropped within two weeks. Strange. Maybe Corgan was jealous of Lashley. Grado was fired, but he returned as Odarg the Great. You either loved this or thought it was incredibly stupid. But I mean, he was technically fired, so it makes their own rules look a bit stupid that he could just reverse his name and come back. Drew Galloway was the man to beat Matt Hardy for his World Heavyweight title after less than two months. So far, Corgan doesn't seem to be a fan of long title reigns. Bobby Lashley turned heel and became this confident, smiling guy. And this was just amazing. In my opinion, it was the best run of Lashley's career. 
He suddenly had the ability to talk, which was weird because he was perfectly fine, but he wasn't before. Lashley's swearing and he's asking to fight everyone. He's the heavyweight champion and all with a beautiful smile on his face. He was not a chicken shit heel either. He was damn scary, but it was also fun watching him in the ring. In March 2016, both Eric Young and Robert Roode left TNA, which was a bit of a shock. They weren't in TNA from the very start, but they had been there for a long time. It was another worrying sign, especially as both guys had been in the upper mid-card and were multiple-time heavyweight champions. It was clear that TNA under Corgan was going to be different as promos began to dominate the show. Luckily, it was all people with strong mic skills. EC3, Mike Bennett, Maria, who was put in charge of the knockouts, by the way, they all got a strong push and loads of TV time. A large part of Billy Corgan's reign is associated with the broken Hardy Boys. I'm not about to sum up the whole storyline yet again. And Corgan didn't solely create this storyline anyway, but he has received credit for portions of it. But basically, Matt had gone completely crazy and was bullying his brother Jeff, and eventually Jeff came around and joined Matt being crazy. This isn't a storyline which everyone loves, but it definitely got TNA a buzz, as they did quite a few revolutionary things with this storyline and the way the matches were shot in cinematic style. Lots of new men and girls had joined TNA with mixed results. Most of them didn't do as well as the Miracle Mike Bennett. Typically, the women's hiring seemed to be better, as Maria, Ali, Sienna and Laurel all became big parts of the show. But on the men's side, we got random French guys. Aaron Rex, the former Damien Sandow. Yeah, he was unfortunately a massive fail for TNA. They tried to do a few things with him, but none of it seemed to work that well. When he was signed, there was huge expectations for him. A bunch of random X Division geeks, none of them ever did anything. Moose did work out alright, a bit better than most. He's still there today. Not everything's going well though. Rosemary has this weird storyline with Bram where he's like a romantic interest and all this weird stuff is happening, and then it just ends without explanation. That happens a few times throughout Corgan's reign. Lashley's dominance over the show was getting to insane levels and he held all the man's titles other than the tag belts. He was the most believable man in wrestling at this time, and he was showing WWE what they missed out on. Major drama behind the scenes in June though, it was reported that TNA had run out of money again, and at the last moment Billy Corgan had stepped in with a loan for Dixie Carter, which made the next few shows possible. And this was not a small amount of money, it was 1.8 million to cover production costs. By August it was reported that Billy Corgan was the new president of TNA replacing Dixie Carter. It seems that he was promised ownership of TNA or something like that, but we'll get on to that. At this point, Billy Corgan is at the height of his powers in TNA. James Storm is unhappy with the outcome of a match with Lashley, where the ref made a mistake, and then randomly Billy Corgan made his way out. I believe it's his first in-ring promo in TNA. He's now being acknowledged as the TNA president too. And this promo is just strange. It's not at all polished. He's muttering and has extremely strange body language. He basically tells Storm he's not good enough, which causes Storm to threaten him with a hammer. He wants to beat a rock star and smash a pumpkin. Corgan's promo skills are so awkward and he suspends James Storm from TNA, it's not a good first look. Bobby Lashley wants to unify all the titles but Corgan won't let him do it. So Bobby called the titles and the division trash and threw away the King of the Mountain and the X Division title. It's interesting that you still see Dixie a fair bit at this time, it's like she still wants to remain an on-screen character even though she's lost her power. The only man seemingly able to stand up to Lashley is Moose and the build is slow but it is good. The crowd are loving this guy. Lashley just keeps ducking him and by the time they finally face each other, the feud has cooled off and well, more company problems have hit by that time. Billy Corgan introduced a new concept to TNA, the Grand Championship. This would be completely like nothing else in wrestling, as Impact tries to copy MMA or maybe even British wrestling aspects. It was three, three minute rounds. Judges would decide who won each round. They wanted it to be perfect for people with short attention spans so it would be a constant action, but it never really felt like constant action and whenever it started to get good the round ended. I think the reason this never really worked is because the wrestlers on the show all fight by the same rules minus one special match in the show where it goes on to be completely different. It's like if you were at a football match and halfway through they just moved the goalposts, it would be weird. And plus, no, you don't want to watch it, you just want to go and watch MMA, not some cheap imitation. I also think too many of the matches were just randomly happening without a storyline. Aaron Rex was mostly used in this division, which is probably why his TNA run failed so hard. Being associated with failure won't help your career. Whenever Corgan turned up on the TNA show, he just looked miserable and weird. I guess it's a different take on the suited and booted owner of a company. Corgan was often backed up by his bodyguard, Aidan O'Shea. He barely even has a Wikipedia page. Corgan looks like such a smackhead. 
Eli Drake's dummy button started appearing during Corgan's reign, and you can't deny that that was very entertaining. These talk shows that Eli Drake does almost feel like the current NWA show where they talk around the desk. Something else which started was Cody Rhodes and he had a decent little run in TNA. It's someone else who is strong on the mic. I can see a trend here. Can't say the same about his wife, Mini Moose, though. I might be Big Moose around here, but you're definitely Mini Moose. Good job tonight. Mini Moose. <laughs> Mini Moose. <laughs> The worst moment took place in October when somebody made the bizarre decision to have Eddie Slapner Edwards beat Bobby Lashley for the world title. Yes, it is played off as a complete upset, but Moose would have made much more sense. Lashley has been portrayed as an absolute killer between the ropes up to this point, and now he can't beat the blandest guy on the roster. A strange decision. He even beats Lashley in the rematch too, proving it not to be a fluke. Corgan, of course, needed to find a new place for his best friend in the world, Tyrus, because the Hardy Boys were doing the broken gimmick and it seemed like Tyrus was in the runnings to get a sort of APA gimmick. Another new storyline starting up was the Death Crew Council, a team of three masked wrestlers who were actually James Storm, Bram and Eddie Kingston. Now TNA was so broke behind the scenes at this point that they were taping 10 shows over three days to save on costs. So they were good until the start of December, when the wheels came off. Rewind a little bit to the middle of October, and there's news everywhere starting to break that there was a major problem going on behind the scenes. TNA had once again run out of money. Corgan was trying to buy TNA. There was some agreement signed that if TNA were to go insolvent again, Billy Corgan would automatically become the majority shareholder. So it went to court, and due to that, all TNA's assets were frozen for the time being and tapings couldn't take place. Corgan went on to lose his court battle to become the owner of TNA, but the judge did order TNA to pay back all the money that he loaned them. As TNA taped in blocks, they were fine, until the start of December that is. But then... For a third year in a row, Jesus Christ. TNA was unable to produce any episodes around Christmas and had to go on a short hiatus. More best off shows was all they could do because if they didn't produce these they would be in breach of their contract with Pop TV. Anthem Sports acquired TNA and Corgan was removed as TNA president. The company was officially changed from TNA to Impact Wrestling. Nowadays, Anthem own 85%, Aralux own 10%, and to this day, as far as I'm aware, Dixie Carter still owns 5% of TNA, now Impact Wrestling. Which is just crazy when you think about it. The Death Crew Council was the biggest casualty of the change of management, as they pretty much killed the storyline off in 2017. It was supposed to end with James Storm beating Lashley for the belt, and a return for a wild slap nuts as another member. Ultimately, I have to say Billy Corgan's tenure was a mixed bag. I'm not going to be too critical of 2015, he wasn't in full control for that half a year and the problems with the TV network completely ruined any chance he had. We can however judge him for 2016. I have to say I'm impressed with the show's presentation despite the money problems. Most people who were pushed looked like stars and it perhaps helped to mask some of the dwindling production values and crowds. The new flock of main eventers was pretty decent. There was an emphasis on pushing people who were strong on the microphone. EC3, Eli Drake, Drew Galloway, Bobby Lashley, Mike Bennett, Cody, Maria, Ali, The Hardys and The Decay all had a good time and came out looking better than they came in. It still felt like TNA, even though there wasn't really anybody left who represented TNA once Kurt Angle had retired. It was a really tough time to inherit a roster, which were either ageing or leaving the company. It was a real rebuilding job and for the most part it was handled well. The Broken Hardys and the cinematic style of filming stuff was a big hit too, and it changed wrestling and it even transitioned into the WWE. The negatives would be the grand title, which was a massive fail considering just how much time and effort was spent on it. I also think many of the lower card signings were questionable. It's not like many of these people are doing anything nowadays. The start of Impact's obsession with Eddie Slapner Edwards is a personal hatred of mine. I was also disappointed with the lack of theme music. I thought there would be something Billy Corgan could approve on, but other than getting Marilyn Manson for the decay, there wasn't really anything standing out here. And I think the knockouts weren't booked incredibly. If you weren't Gail Kim, Maria or Ali, you really didn't get any mic time, storylines or just anything of any interest. It's like when that whole dollhouse thing went wrong, they gave up on the women. So yeah, a really dark time in TNA. TNA averaged 330,000 viewers in 2015, 310,000 in 2016. So not a huge drop off despite the worst TV network, but fans were stopping tuning in. I do wonder now what might have happened if Corgan had won his lawsuit to stay in charge of TNA. He didn't do anything wrong in my opinion when he loaned them that money and tried to take over, it was in his rights. 
TNA came so close to going under multiple times here and there, and the scars are still clear to see on the current Impact Wrestling from the Corgan times. But he's not to blame, and if you don't agree with that, you're lame. 